All right. Happy Monday, Jonathan Piper. How you doing? Good. How are you, BJ Morgan? Very good. It looks like you were actually at the Museum of Making Music and not mom at home. You're actually bringing mom into my home now, which is amazing. Yeah, this is my second home, the Museum of Making Music. Uh, and I, I left first home today to come to second home. Uh, this is not my Zoom virtual background. Uh, I was getting used to that one. I was like, yeah, it's, <laughs> this is real. I don't have any weird uh, green screen effects when I put my hands in front of my face. No, no, absolutely. Um, for everybody that's just joining us today, uh, my name is BJ Morgan. I'm the marketing manager at the Museum of Making Music. And uh, while we are currently working remotely and some of us you know, are able to go back to the museum and check up on things, uh, we are bringing the museum to your homes. And if, you, if you're unable to visit the museum right now, um, we wanna bring you the museum and we are going to uh, talk about some very interesting artifacts. Today is Museum Monday with our very own Dr. Jonathan Piper. And uh, we're gonna explore, uh, well, tell us what we're gonna explore today, Dr. Jonathan. <laughs> Today we're going to be looking at uh, player pianos and piano players. Um, not live humans, uh, but machines called piano players. Um, not only are they really fun artifacts, but they, they tie really closely into this whole uh, music at home idea that I'm sure a lot of people are confronting right now. This instrument here, uh, while not one of the earliest player pianos, uh, gives you a sense of what we're talking about here. This is a full upright piano. But you'll notice it has a little window up there with a player piano roll inside. Um, and these rolls, I'll pull one out here, are pieces of paper that have very long pieces of paper that have perforations in them. And those perforations correspond to notes. Um, so the way that this works is there's a pneumatic engine inside, basically. Um, and that creates suction against the back of the paper. And whenever there's a perforation in the paper, air can get through, and that will then trigger pneumatic action on the other side of the paper. For example, a lever hitting uh, the hammer of the uh, 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 corresponding to the string. And that's how a player piano uh, will sort of automatically play itself. Um, the early player pianos would have been powered by foot pedals. Let me see if I can get a shot of the foot pedals at the bottom there or uh, later models also introduced electric pumps. So you could have these powered either by foot power, um, human power or electricity. Um, and they hit a bit of a snag early on because of course you realize that, you know, a lot of people have pianos already in their homes and they might be pretty good at the piano, but maybe they want that extra little bump or maybe it's a family that already invested heavily in a piano, uh, piano being a, a really strong marker of kind of like middle-class arrival. Once you've made it, you buy a piano. Um, you know, think about, again, before recorded music, but also we're talking about before cars. Uh, we're talking about before so many things that we take for granted nowadays. A piano would have been one of the most significant purchases a family could make since buying your own home. Um, so if you have me, you have if you don't want to invest in a new player piano, which would cost about the same as your piano, plus the cost of the player mechanism, you could get what was called a piano player. Um, and the piano player is a device that you push up to the piano and it does what this thing does, but just in and of itself. Uh, and, it, and it plays the keyboard of your own personal piano. So again, you can see here the, the uh, I'm going to pick up my laptop, so sorry for motion sickness. <laughs> yeah. um, so we have the player piano roll there, and you can see it's got all the, the perforations that we would expect. You've got the pedals down there. But again, what makes this such an interesting piece is when we come around the back of it and underneath, there are all those little magic fingers. And those fingers would line up perfectly with um, the middle section of a piano keyboard. And as the roll spins and as the perforations line up, uh, you, these would actually move. They're covered with felt and they would play your piano's keyboard for you. Um, so a really fascinating way to, uh, again, kind of automate the process of playing a piano to bring 
quote unquote recorded music into the home uh, in an era before sound recording and sound reproduction uh, was a viable in-home technology. Uh, really cool feature is it also has an automated uh, lever for the sustain pedal there. So you can push that over your piano's sustain pedal. Um, and then some of the models as, as the uh, technology progressed started to introduce uh, levers like these, which would allow you to control um, volume, uh, tempo, and kind of like the, the general sense of phrasing. So this is, this is a Metro style uh, model from the Aeolian Piano Company. And Metro style was where they would they would actually have a marker for the tempo right on the on the, the piano roll, so that you you as the pianolist or player pianist uh, could control the kind of the expression of your player piano's playing. Um, and so uh, later attempts would be to you know bring out the melodic line and the accompaniment line uh, at different volumes, so you could independently control the volume of kind of the melody of the tune and the accompaniment of the tune. So companies were trying really hard to make these things very, very expressive um, instruments. Um, it it is, sounds like you have to have a, 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 a skill set in and of itself to be a, a pianolist then. You, uh, granted, you're not playing the keys, but you still have to pay attention and uh, you know, follow along the music as you're playing. Was this a, was this a career path for some folks or was it just more of a uh, in-home entertainment uh, feature? Largely in home entertainment. Um, I think that a lot of manufacturers had had very grand visions for how this was going to work out. Um, that you could have, um, you know, potentially people coming to to see a performance, to hear a performance by a pianolist, and different pianolists could have styles based on how they manipulate the levers and what decisions they would tend to make for volume, for tempo, that kind of thing. Um, but it did, the, the pianola really did tend to play out as a home entertainment device. Uh, and it didn't last terribly long. Uh, the first commercial models were coming out right around the turn of the century. And by 1910 or so, they had largely been superseded by the, the um, the inner player piano. So the, the player piano that has the player mechanism built right into it. Um, there was a big event in 1908, the Buffalo Convention, as it's, as it's come to be known, where a bunch of uh, player piano manufacturers got together and they, because up until now, every manufacturer had basically done their own thing because they were all competing with each other. It was brand new technology. Uh, there were a bunch of roles that had only 65 keys on them uh, because that was a, a way to fit um, you know, to get the right number of holes on your paper. So some manufacturers were going with 65 notes all the way across. Some manufacturers were getting much smaller holes, but they were able to get uh, 88 keys in, 88 notes. Uh, and so at the Buffalo Convention, all these manufacturers came together and decided, okay, we're moving forward with 88. Uh, and that became the standard. Uh, and so you basically had this, this massive consolidation, but smaller companies that had really, you know, staked their futures on 65 or some other format uh, basically went out of business because they couldn't switch over production to 88. And that also meant that the poor pianola didn't have a whole lot of a future because of that standardization, because of the reliability that every player piano you buy now can play every role uh, produced afterward. That was a big boon uh, for the player piano uh, in, in the eyes of the consumer. It sounds like there was no uh, software upgrade path for the, the pianola in today's modern terms then you just couldn't, you couldn't make that functionality an easy accessory or add on. Yeah, you couldn't just update the firmware, uh, right. <laughs> unfortunately. And there were some, there were some pianos that had the ability to play either the 65 note versions or the 80, 88 note versions. So there was that kind of backward compatibility built in. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it was not feasible uh, to make a big switch because it's a, it's a whole lot of machinery um, inside the unit. Um, the other thing that made player pianos really interesting, um, not only is just the idea of automating, but the process of um, commodifying um, music. Because uh, again, this was, this was basically the way that people got recordings into their homes. Um, when you think about the ability that you can go to a store and you can buy a roll and go home and that song is now played for you in your house, that's kind of magical when you think about it. Again, it's trivial now. We go on Spotify, we go on iTunes, whatever it is, 99 cents, boom, it's on all of our devices. Um, or we just stream it, you know, pay $9.99 a month and we have access to millions and millions of tracks. But this idea that you could pay, so 
Uh, I found a catalog from 1918 uh, with prices ranging from 33 cents up to 77 cents. And the price would be largely based on just how much paper is involved because uh, the length of the paper is based on how long the tune is. If the tune is only a couple minutes long, you don't need a whole lot of paper. If, if you want to play you know, multiple minutes of music, you might need longer paper. Uh, 33 cents in $1918 now correlates to about five bucks. And that, that 70 cent roll uh, comes closer to 15, 16 bucks. So when you think about it, you know, those are prices kind of in line with what we pay now for a CD or something, but this is one tune. This yeah. is one tune that you're paying up to 16 bucks for uh, or 15 bucks um, to bring home and, and have with you. But it really is this amazing sea change in the way that we understand our relationship with music. Uh, it's not just something that a live person goes to the piano and plays, it's something that you can literally collect and put in a box and put it on your shelf and you can pull it out and you can say, I want that song and you can play that song. It's, it's really kind of mind blowing when you think about the difference that that made in people's lives. Yeah, that's pretty wild. I mean, considering, I mean, how many uh, people invested in a player piano that they did so, so they could have music in the home because they weren't maybe uh, a musician themselves or were just, you know, ha didn't have the aptitude yet to play those pieces. But I guess then they, having the player piano, you could still play a player piano, like a regular piano right you didn't have to have the role going it would still function as a regular piano am i am i correct in saying that yeah absolutely and that's another reason why the the pianola maybe didn't have as bright of a future as the player piano because the pianola you have to have another instrument to go along with it the player piano you know you can just walk up to this and play uh and in fact um so you know, if, if we kind of follow the trajectory player pianos were all the rage in the teens and 20s and then when radio started coming up in the late 20s that was a more viable home entertainment device. You could get audio, you know, sound, you could get talking, you could get in the news on this one device. Uh, in, in addition to music, it wasn't just, you know, the piano, you could get classical orchestras playing on a radio. Uh, but then definitely by the stock market crash of 1929 and the onset of the depression, the player piano market was just decimated, totally wiped out. Um, and then what ended up happening is that people would, you know, buy warehouses full of player pianos for really, really cheap, they would strip out the player mechanism, just gut the whole thing, and then sell it on as a piano uh, to people who couldn't afford a piano at that point. So you could buy, uh, you know, a, a, an X player piano for 30 bucks or something during the 30s, and that would still be, you know, a decent chunk of money. But, you know, for 30 bucks, you could have a piano now, because somebody had converted a player piano back into just a piano. That's pretty wild. I, you know, I only, the only down the only shortcoming of the player piano that I see is there's no drum tracks involved. So you, you know, you'd have to hire a drummer if you wanted, you know, a, another, another component of the band before radio hits. I can understand why people took to radio. You get the, you know, your full band, your news reports and everything. But if you're just relying on a player piano for your, for your music, then you're kind of limited to that, that one timbre. Are there any, are there any other uh, cons of, of the player piano? Like what, what would be their basis of like with their big strengths We're obviously having music in the home, but like, were there any shortfalls that people were concerned about? Uh, there were, and a lot of them did get worked out as the technology developed. Um, so initial, you know, early player pianos, um, you know, it's it's an analog, it's a piece of paper, but it is effectively digital information. It's on or off. Um, and so, you know, with the very first models, it was literally on and off. That's all the control that you got from a lever. Um, and so if you're playing a tune, it's all loud and it's all at one speed. And that speed is the speed at which the 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 roll is turning. Uh, if you have if you happen to have variations in your power source, uh, if you happen to pedal at different rates, you might end up with slight fluctuations in the tempo of the, of the tune that you're playing back. Um, so a lot of the the first innovations were in giving more control over tempo, and then giving more control over volume. And a there was an innovation from the Again, I think the early teen, early knots or aughts, early aughts, maybe even late uh, 1890s, um, that was trying to introduce um, expression information into the role, so that you could start to include information about specific information about tempo, specific information about rubato, or about uh, you know crescendo, decrescendo, and that is what ended up becoming something known as the reproducing piano. Um, and that was in the, uh, really in the teens uh, and then really popular in the 20s. The reproducing piano, it, it takes the, pia the player concept and goes even farther in that it allows you to basically record a performance. You're not just recording a song, you're recording a specific performance 
play that back on a reproducing piano and you basically get the performance on your piano. So a lot of the marketing uh, around reproducing pianos at the time really uh, tried to hone in this idea of, you know, the master's fingers on your piano. Uh, this idea that you could record, uh, you know, like, um, the first thing that comes to mind is Grieg. Grieg recorded his own piano concertos on uh, a device that could capture for on rolls, and then you could bring Grieg's performance of Grieg's music into your home. And so that was a huge selling point for reproducing pianos. Um, and classical music, uh, the consumption of classical music really took off on reproducing pianos because it was kind of like, it was almost as if you could have the authoritative performances of the classics uh, in your home. So again, really powerful concept that not only do you have a tune playing in your house, but it's as if you are listening to somebody else playing. Um, really just kind of mind blowing. Um, hard to really think about how different that was uh, in an age where, you know, if you want to compare uh, three different pianists take on a Greek piano concerto, again, just go on Spotify and search for different names or just search for Greek piano concerto and you're going to get a ton of different recordings and you can compare them if you want. Uh, but you couldn't do that you know, in, in 1915. Um, so suddenly people in their homes have that ability. Um, and it, it was really a game changer in terms of the way that people related to music. Yeah, it seems like that would be a really good, um, like a mentorship piece. Like if you were uh, an aspiring artist and really want to know how the essence of a piece was captured to have the, the, the capabilities of a reproducing piano and have, you know, they basically played by the the composer or the artist who is, you know, chosen by a composer to represent the piece. I know we have a, a reproducing piano in the museum and through uh, the generous work of our, some of our volunteers, it's been uh, restored to working condition. Yeah. And in hearing it, it, it is extremely expressive. Um, unfortunately, I don't know that, that the, our current player piano has, is in that same condition where we can compare the two uh, side by side, but I can only imagine, yeah, it, that once people had this, um, uh, ability to uh, have their music interpreted and basically stamped and sent out to the masses like here's how it's supposed to be then it kind of is a whole new ball game now we had a question um mm -hmm. which kind of leads me from this path down to the next one is prior to the player piano prior to the reproducing piano, we're, we're going back in time was there any instrument that was a precursor to this was there any uh, innovations that the player piano became modeled after um, yeah, in, in a way, not, um, so we have to take it, it's slightly circuitous. Um, the, the player piano's big innovation is, is the pneumatic aspect of it, um, where you're sucking air through, uh, through holes in a piece of paper. Uh, but if you take that, if you think of the, the rolling thing, and if you think about, you know, the little digital on and off signals for specific pitches, uh, you start to get back to, uh, music boxes. Uh, and um, uh, barrel organs. So this idea that you could have a basically a cylinder that has little uh, little pins on it. Uh, you load that into a mechanism. This spins and it it pulls on tines, and the tines are you know tines resonate and produce different notes. Um, and you kind of get the same idea there. Um, I'm gonna hop on over again. I apologize for motion sickness here. Uh, <laughs> um, but we do have this great uh, set of four um, music boxes that would have been from the latter half of the 19th century. Uh, and these are pretty sizable, as you can see. This one uh, right here is, what, about three feet wide or so. Uh, and you can see inside that massive cylinder. Uh, hopefully I got the angle right. Um, BJ, let me know if I need to move this. But um, the cylinder with all those, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of little pins on it. Uh, so that would spin around and that will uh, pull on all the tines under there and produce a bunch of notes. Um, the, the big differences, of course, are uh, the music boxes there. If you can't switch out the cylinders, you've only got a couple of tunes. Uh, and so you invest in this very large piece of furniture and it only plays a couple of tunes for you. And then if you want more, you have to go out and buy a new music box. Um, there were eventually innovations uh, by companies that allowed for interchangeable cylinders and interchangeable discs for the music box. Um, but you know, you can think that you, you might've been a little upset if you invested in a set of music boxes before that happened. Uh, and suddenly you've got these huge things that only play five or six tunes. Um, and it is remarkable that those music boxes do play multiple tunes because you get to the end and the whole cylinder just boop, shifts over by like a millimeter and suddenly it's a whole new set of pins lining up at each time. 
that song finishes boop, over by one more millimeter. Uh, so really amazing engineering. Uh, and then again, yeah, the barrel organs, uh, same kind of deal where you have um, uh, rotating uh, spindles or barrels that, that will activate a mechanism. Um, but then there are also organs um, that are pneumatically driven that have like book organs, I think is the name, um, where you feed in basically this, but it's all folded up uh, like a book rather than a big rule. Uh, and that can play a big organ. And that was a huge thing. Um, I know, especially like in, in the Netherlands, um, not my forte there. So I'm going to stop before I say something inaccurate. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. there were related technologies, um, you know, music boxes and barrel organs go back centuries. Um, but really, if you look at the, the latter half of the 19th century, it's really where you start to see this turn into an automation of music. Yeah, that got me thinking uh, further down the line, either further down the timeline or before that, I'm not sure either. Uh, but like melodians and the big, you know, you're, when you're on the merry-go-round, the big organ and the, the music that plays from the central uh, point of the, uh, the rotation. I, I don't know if that, was that a precursor to the piano piano or was that a uh, a relative of a, a further generation down the line. Um, I, Sorry, I don't mean to be taken off off to the woods. Yeah. I, I know you did primary research on the player piano, but I'm like, let's go over here, let's go over here. But uh, I, that fascinates me to take it from the idea of a player piano, then either the Nickelodeon or the Melodeon or you know wherever we're going from there. Yeah, again, my 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 understanding, uh, and I, I don't want to try to sound too authoritative about this, is that a lot of these were uh, just coming out of some core technology. Um, so, like the rotating spindle for music boxes for bell organs, for the the pneumatic idea, which goes into book organs and player pianos. Um, all of it seems to kind of splinter off uh, from that. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to get us off track. We'll, we'll, we'll stay back on the player piano and the pianola. Um, what else can you tell us about these fascinating uh, instruments? Um, well, what, I think what's, what's really remarkable about these is, is just how popular they were. Um, you know, I think it was 1911 that the sale of player pianos actually surpassed traditional pianos. Uh, so there was a point in time where people were so enamored of this technology and so into the new possibility that it, that it delivered um, that they would rather buy a player piano than a conventional piano. Uh, and that might have just been because a player piano is a piano plus, you know, it's a piano plus another thing. Um, but it is kind of remarkable that these things were that popular. Um, and the reproducing piano... Um, was so popular. So there was a Steinway reproducing piano that was made uh, for a time. And I believe that in something like 1920, the price was $4,000, I want to say, which when you think about how that converts into 2020 dollars, I mean, this is tens of thousands of dollars. Um, and Steinway still couldn't keep up uh, with, with deliveries. I mean, it was that popular. People were spending lots and lots of money on this idea that you could bring uh, another person's interpretation into your home. Uh, and I don't know if that speaks to uh, maybe an untapped potential or an untapped market that human beings kind of always had that, that we wanted to be able to listen to music in the home at all times. Um, that music is both an activity that we that we make music, but we also listen to music. Uh, that maybe there always has been that desire, or if it was something in the milieu, something in the zeitgeist, uh, where people were so into this concept, um, but they were extremely popular. And then again, the stock market crashes, radio comes along and it kind of bottoms out. Uh, they came up a little bit, you know, in the 50s, 60s, uh, but, you know, we're at a point where there are a lot of player pianos out there in the world uh, and it's getting harder and harder to keep them in playing condition because they rely on parts that were, that were being made 100 plus years ago. Uh, every part now you would have to make yourself uh, from other parts that weren't intended for, you know, for that purpose. So uh, it, it's a bit of a predicament now, but it's, it's really interesting, I think, to, to look back on it, um, you know, just in this context of ma make, making music at home, doing things in the home. And, you know, if you wanted music in your house 100 years ago, this was how you did it. Pretty amazing. Well, I guess with the, the ubiquity and the popularity of the instrument. We also had another question. Brian is just the question master on, on YouTube right now. Uh, he asks, uh, and I'm curious to know this too, is if, if someone wanted to record their own music, how would they, would, is it, could you accomplish such a thing through the player piano? How was it possible? Was it a market for people to print their own music if they were interested in doing such a thing? 
That's a that's a, a really interesting question. I don't have a great answer for that. Um, I know that, that you know there were companies that produced rolls, and they produced rolls in very large numbers, and they had special machines for it. Um, and to be honest, I don't know if that ever became available to home or amateur musicians, um, where you could you know like make your own roll or the thing where you could go record your your tune on a CD at the mall uh, twenty years ago or something, and you know, pay pay a buck and you get your own tune on a CD. I don't know if they had that kind of a if they had that kind of possibility. My my guess is no, but again, I, I can't. I can't give a definite definitive answer on that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I know that there is a display up at the Seattle Museum, or uh, no, it's the uh, the the MIM, the Phoenix Museum, the uh, one in Scottsdale, where they show uh, the devices that you know the mass produce these pieces of sheet music, and it's just amazingly elaborate. I can only imagine that trying to program your own music, if you you would need a role that would a would tell you where the notes are, and you know be able to carve out how long those need, notes need to be sustained. I can only imagine it would be. A, uh, a time consuming process unless there was some way to punch it as in real time, which I, I don't know how that would, you know, in my, my brain that would be done. I know we featured um, merchandise in the uh, museum store where you could punch out little holes on this. It's probably about a little ticker tape long and mm -hmm. make your own music box music. Yeah. Uh, and it's relatively simple to do that. Uh, but yeah, it's, it'd be, a, it'd be neat to, to kind of study, if there was an interest in programming your own music and how that was accomplished, if it was even possible. Right. Uh, I, again, I know that the, you know, the primary marketing, the primary appeal was about other people's interpretations. So yeah, I, I would be really curious to look into that. Um, and you kind of got me thinking, there's got to be some kind of enterprising, you know, hacker, uh, maker kind of person out there who has figured out a way to, in real time, manipulate the, the on-off action of the, the suction you know, because you could, if you, if you really wanted to, um, you could potentially have a device that just sits on top of, uh, of the holes and in real time allows suction to get in and out of every different hole and you could program that to do different things. I, you know, maybe there's a renaissance in player piano hacking um, that's about to, <laughs> about to happen. I think it, you could get some really cool stuff out of it. Um, it's, it's all done by MIDI now, MIDI over Bluetooth yeah. and, and, and networks in, in yeah. So we can we can make it happen. Let's 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 throw all of our cables together and all of our computers. Flap a, flap a Raspberry Pi on it. Yep. Just throw just throw a, a Wi-Fi chip on that that player piano. We'll get it working. <laughs> well, Jonathan, what else do we uh, can we credit the player piano to, to to doing? Where where did it take off from here? Did it have any uh, um, implications on future generations of instruments? Um, people have tried to introduce um, player mechanisms for other instruments. They haven't been nearly successful. Um, you know, we have a great, uh, the Roll Monica in our collection, which was a, a, an attempt at automating the harmonica, um, where you would have a uh, little device that you plug a harmonica into and then a little crank, uh, and you run a roll through it. And again, the same idea, whether or not your air can pass through a piece of paper, if it does it activates the read. If it doesn't, nothing happens. Uh, all of the papers, of course, had to be wax coated so that uh, they don't <laughs> degrade immediately from, from being blown on. Um, those, those didn't take off, uh, as you might imagine, but they, it's a really fascinating thing. Um, you know, there are still companies that, that produce uh, you know, automated machines for violins. Uh, I mean, that was another thing that people tried to do around this time with the, the player piano is automating. And come up with ways to make it as humanistic as possible, you know, and to make the violin as expressive as possible while a machine is playing it. Um, so there's still a lot of innovation that's happening, you know, in this, in the realm of automating musical instruments. Uh, but I, we haven't quite seen anything like the player piano in terms of popularity and social impact, um, you know, crammed into about 30 years. Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, any other uh, thoughts and feelings about the player piano that you'd like to share with us? Well, I did want to make sure that we have a couple minutes to look at the reproducing piano in action. Uh, okay. Just because we have it, you know, and it's beautiful. It sounds great. Uh, it's a gorgeous piano on its own, and it, it reproduces performances. So uh, we're going to hop over there. Uh, Dave is with me. We're going to hop on over and uh, check out our reproducing piano. Sounds good. While we're traveling, too, when you when you mentioned, you know, having a, a pianola attendee or a, a person who would manage, like, the tempo and the speeds, and I, would, I had a, a, a vision, a scenario in my head that I painted where it's like, oh, yeah, we always hire, you know, it's, Bill, because he always plays the right tempos for this piece where we, you know, we don't hire 
person B because, you know, they always play the song too slow or they play the mm -hmm. song too fast. And, you know, you, you become a, you know, a, 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 a rock star pianola player by how well you uh, interpret the music tempo and the markings. And right. I was just amused by that thought. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that, that that role would have ever really caught on as a, right, right. As a serious musician role. Um, <laughs> but it really is interesting to think about that possibility that, you know, you could have somebody who gets really good at manipulating the tempo of a role, um, you know, for, <laughs> for whatever effect. Can you imagine the title virtuoso pianolist? Right, right. <laughs> Um, so this is our, our, our chickering uh, reproducing piano. Um, it's a, a baby grand, um, 1923. Uh, and I'm just going to turn it on. Uh, so what's going to happen, this is an electrically powered one. Uh, what's going to happen is that the, um, the pneumatic pump is going to start up first. All right. Uh, and then you're going to see the roll start to move. And then we should see the keys start to move of their own accord. Quick question. Did we, did we update our audio settings on Zoom to make sure we don't get the, the background right, let's, blocked let's, out? Sure, let me turn on my original sound. All right. Because we don't want to lose that. Yeah. The, the process of turning it off where it, it, it just kind of gives up in the middle of the thing. <laughs> that's pretty great and it, i mean when was that when do you know what when that uh role was created uh that role um mm, let's see i think that no no i don't that's okay but it's it hasn't been you know it's probably uh Several decades ago, maybe more, maybe 50, 60, 70 years ago. Is that a, a, a good guess? Uh, I would imagine. Um, maybe 100 years ago? Yeah, probably about 100. Wow. That's like, that's like you know, seeing as it happened in the past, just imagining the, the hands of the artist there on the piano playing that. That's, that's pretty amazing. That's, yeah. that's wild. Yeah. Pretty, pretty magical. Um, and what's also amazing is that, you know, there, there, there are still uh, at least one company, uh, QRS, that's still putting out um player piano rolls um so you can still get you know pop tunes um arranged uh and recorded for a player piano if you if you really want to well and i know the modern counterpart like the yamaha clavinova uh has a similar feature you know but it's mostly midi driven now the, the notes are interpreted by midi data the keys go down and it looks like just like a player piano in fact i think uh uh, we've, I've had, I've heard stories of people recording their performances and then, you know, the family has those performance still, even uh, long after the person is gone who recorded them. So it's yeah, still yeah. a modern, a modern activity. Right. The disc clavier. Uh, yes. Which, the disc clavier. Yeah. You could record yourself onto a floppy disc, uh, which is kind of amazing. And that, yeah, now you can record yourself into the cloud, uh, with some of the newer versions of this technology. Um, so yeah, it, it's still out there. Automated pianos are, they're still there. Um, they, again, just aren't quite as popular and, and, you know, it's, yeah, amazing moment in history where automated pianos were all the rage. Awesome. Well, Jonathan, thanks for your time and your research and for making the trip to the museum to check up on all of our artifacts and sharing uh, the player piano, the pianola and the reproducing piano with us today. I hope everybody had a uh, uh, learned a lot today or at least was mildly entertained by the seeing the reproducing piano play. I, I'm always amazed at that. That's, yeah. it's, it's always a fun thing. So um, when we uh, are open again, welcoming visitors, please come by and check out these amazing instruments. We'll see you later. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Bye.